Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to welcome Mason Porter from University of Oxford here at UNAM. Uh, he will uh, give an overview, talk of uh, his various uh, research uh, fields. And please, Mason. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so, so even though I'm from Los Angeles and lived 25 years there, this is my first time to Mexico. Very surprising for somebody who's from, from LA to um, have waited this long, so it's good to finally come. Um, so I'm gonna talk about um, cascades and social influence on networks. So this is gonna be uh, a talk more on, on the modeling side and about how to do some simple models of social influence and what they might be able to tell you. Um, I've put a version, I think it's actually the same version of this talk up on SlideShare um, a couple weeks ago. Um, and you can, I have my Twitter account there and I know that I have a post there that has the, the, the talks on, the, the slides on SlideShare. So if you're interested, um, afterwards and looking things in more detail, then that will have like the references and, and so on. But anyway, you can, you can go find it. Okay, so I'll give an introduction to these sorts of things, and then I'm gonna talk about the problem of modeling social influence. Um, Multi-stage complex contagions is a particular model that my collaborators and I have, have come up with, so I'll, I'll use that as a focal example. I mean, there's other, there's other examples that one can find in the literature that others have come up with. Um, and then I will talk about a couple of more recent things um, very briefly, one of which is to bring ideas from what's called persistence homology. This, this comes from computational topology in, into these studies. So that, that one gets a little bit more technical, so I'm only gonna look at, the, just tell you briefly to so show why we're doing it, and hopefully some of you will be interested in looking at the paper. And I also wanted to briefly talk about a model that we have for popularity cascades on Facebook. Um, that, that one does not have network structure in it, and is what I like to call a small data project. Um, I have ambivalent feelings about big data. Sometimes I like it, sometimes I don't. But, but there's certain ways of using data within models that you can, you can actually help directly in the models, and that I like quite a bit. Okay, so, so one thing that's gonna be familiar um, to most of you, or maybe all of you, are ordinary differential equations and partial differential equations. So, so an example of an ODE would be a toy model for a biological epidemic, such as a susceptible infected um, recovered model. And this is assuming that people are well mixed. So either, either the social connections are dense enough, or really you're assuming everybody talks to everybody else, but if they're dense enough, this can be reasonable. And th this is done via a compartment model, so you've got the change in the number of susceptibles over time, this will go down because susceptibles will get infected at some rate. The infected in turn will come from susceptibles, people getting infected at the same rate, and um, there'll be some rate of decay where people will become either recovered or removed depending on how fatalistic you are. Um, same model though, and then you have that, okay. So, so this is one of type of compartment models, so R and I and S are compartments, and you have some sort of transition between them, but you're assuming that everybody is interacting with everybody else, um, so homogeneously mixed, well mixed, and so on. Um, if you want to incorporate some space, think of, think of the Black Plague from, from, from Europe, where, where you had waves of disease going, going across the continent, you can add a diffusion term, you can add a Laplacian. So that will incorporate space in, in some form, but it does not incorporate social interactions. Okay, so, so you, you still have approximations of being well mixed when you, when you add that kind of space, but you have some spatial effects. Okay, so let's just say we want to think about put, putting a disease model or, or a model for social influence um, on an actual social network. So you have, a you have a network structure of who talks to whom, and that is going to affect um, how any sort of disease or idea can propagate. So the people are what are called nodes or, or vertices, um, if you prefer, and the social connections between them are ties or, or edges or links, depending on what language um, you like to use. And so this is going to have an effect on any dynamical process that you put on, on top of it. Um, so not just epidemics, not just social influence, but also oscillators. Um, or, or voter models or, or anything else you put on top of it. And so, so one of the basic questions and, and the question that, that this talk is an example of is how does this kind of non-trivial connectivity affect dyna some dynamics on top of it? Does it slow down spreading? Does it speed up spreading? Or when does it slow it down or speed it up? Does it, does it affect whether you have an epidemic? Um, does it affect who, who adopts a certain contagion? Who, who adopts a certain idea and so on? Um, there's also a vice versa because more generally you actually have a dynamical process but the network itself is also changing. So if somebody is sick, hopefully they will stay home and that will affect the network structure, right? So the dynamics of the network affects the dynamics on the networks and vice versa. 
Now, in this particular talk, I'm going to assume the network is static, and so there's an assumption involved, and what you do is you look at the relative time scales. So if the time scale of the dynamical process is much faster than the network, then maybe it's reasonable to take the network as constant to leading order and, and look at how the process changes. If the dynamics of the network itself is faster than the dynamical dynamics of the process, maybe you can freeze the state of the nodes and, and look at the network changing. And then the most generic case is when these, these time scales are sufficiently comparable that you really have to consider them both. Right, that's the most generic one. Okay, so I have um, a, a tutorial article, which is, um, well, we have our referee report, so, so we have to make some changes. And if you look at this and have any comments, please send them to me so that I can think about those as well as we change them. And so, so this is essentially just, it's a tutorial to dynamical systems on networks, mostly in the case of static networks, but a little bit in the case of networks changing, and that tries to lay out um, you know, how we think one would do things. And it has some pointers to the field and so on, some example calculations. Um, and as mentioned, if you have comments uh, on it, I'd appreciate um, getting them. Okay, so, so let's talk about cascades per se. I'm, I'm gonna have to kind of tell you what a cascade is. Um, the kind of idea of a cascade is that you start with, you start with maybe people adopted something, they adopted something and they, they turned from state zero to state one, and by virtue of some people having adopted something or becoming diseased, that will affect the probability that others also adopted or, 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 or or get sick, and so this can actually have a domino effect. So a cascade is referring to a domino effect of some, of some dynamics on a network, and you can define it in various ways, whether you wanna say a certain fraction adopt or enough people adopt in a certain time scale, but the idea is that some adoption activity influences more adoption activity to occur. Okay, so, so why should we bother? Um, so I'm a mathematician, and, and my motivation is that these things are very interesting to study, and that they give you tractable examples of how network structure can affect dynamics. So that, that's, my, that's my main reason for doing it, but there, there is also a very important connection to the real world, so there, so there are practical reasons to do this, even though th this is sort of where my heart is. Okay, so I don't know if you guys know who Rick Durrett is, he's a mathematician, he likes to say that the real world is a nice place to visit, um, so so I've, I've stolen his quote. Um, and then there's another issue of complex contagions versus simple contagions. It's a couple of pieces of terminology um, that, are, that are in the literature. Um, what I mean basically by a simple contagion, like a toy model of a biological epidemic would usually be modeled as a simple contagion. You have some person who's sick and there's a d direct transmission from that person to some other person to get sick. So you can actually say identify the edge perhaps over, over which that, this transmission occurred. A complex contagion, which is which is a terminology that um, David that Damon Santola and Michael Macy invented uh, for social contagions, cannot be approximated e even in toy form that way, right? If I adopt something, if I if I buy some new product, the chance of my being able to say, okay, it's this one other specific person who influenced me. I mean, that's not what happens, right? Lots of my friends influence me, and I see things on the news and so on. Um, so you get what's called social reinforcement, right? Several people tell me, okay, this product is really good, and then eventually maybe I buy it. And so there's a fundamental difference in modeling biological epidemics and, 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 social, and social epidemics or social I ideas, because in one case, in simplified form, okay, maybe you can identify an edge where it's been transported. In the other case, even the most simple example, you can't do it. Okay, so that's, that's what I view as, as, as a difference. Um, as far as I can tell, the terminology of, of complex contagion comes from the 2007 paper of Santola and Macy. Okay, so, so one thing you would do in social contagions is you might study social influence, you might have mass movements. So some people might start, um, you know, like in the um, Arab Spring, some people might start with, with some of their tweets and that might lead to something much bigger. Um, you can have memes on, on social media like Facebook and Twitter, right? There was, um, there was a meme to say, okay, what are these 10 books from my childhood that I remember and, and various other memes, and some of these spread very far and some of them don't spread very far. So one of the types of questions that people try to answer is, is that given that I see some meme, you know, which ones are gonna spread very far, right? How far are they gonna spread? How long are they gonna last? Because, you know, um, people who do marketing want to know which things will go viral, right? So if we could come up with a way to predict what goes viral, and I'm not going to do that, I have no idea how to do that, but you know, this is somehow one of the goals that's, that's there. Um, you can also talk about population or adoption of, of Facebook applications, and this is actually considering Facebook from, from 2007, which is their Cambrian era, um, and there, the, 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 these specific applications like Pirates versus Ninjas that were popular at the time. Um, so there's some data from that, and so I'll, I'll come back to this later because we've subsequently done some modeling using some of that old data. And then, of course, biological epidemics. 
So this picture over here comes from a 2010 um, paper in science by Damon Santola, and there's something he did that was really, really cool. And the reason I think it's cool is actually different from the reason most others do, but what he did is the following. He designed a social experiment um, using, um, using some online tools, so people getting sort of medical advice. And he engineered the social network, what I like to call an in vitro social network, indicating who could see who else's advice. So the very, and then he examined the influence on there about whether people adopted, um, adopted things that their neighbors adopted and, and how long it did so. So th these plots are sort of saying how often people adopted as a function of time, as a function of days, and these are showing the, connection, the, the network connections that he established. Okay, so the adoption dynamics is just whatever people are doing. So it's some complicated dynamics as opposed to a simple model, and, I, and I'll show you a couple examples of these simple models. But the network itself is, is much more simplistic than a real social network, than an in vivo social network, such that you can imagine actually doing some mathematics with a social network without exact connectivity. So the idea is that by putting an in vitro social network, he brings social science in, into um, you know, more of a relation like you have with mathematics and physics because they have the same network that I might study in a, in a simplified case, as opposed to some real social network which is much more complicated. So, so that's the reason that I think his work is cool. Um, unfortunately, of course, it does involve a lot of funding to set those things up, so it's not like you can just go in the lab and automatically do that, but it's nice. Okay, so let's suppose you wanna, you wanna model um, social influence. So what, what challenges are involved? Um, so suppose there's something that looks like a social contagion. Um, there's a famous series of papers by, by Fowler and Christakis, the first of which talked about the spread of obesity over, over a large social network. Um, so the type of observation you have is the following. I have, I have a bunch of different people in a social network, and I have a time series for each person. And I, I then have, in the individual time series, so if I'm measuring obesity, you could measure it with what's called a body mass index, which is a type of scalar. So I would have this scalar as a function of time for each of the people in my social network, and, I, and if, if, there, if people are getting more obese as a function of time, I would see this number increasing, right? So I have, I have time streams for every person, and I see these numbers increasing, and it looks like perhaps Perhaps, you know, if, if some people are getting fatter, maybe some of their neighbors are as well. So you wonder if there is an epidemic. Um, okay, so I'm given this time series. Is there, is there an epidemic? Well, generically, there's at least three different things that can occur. And unless you do some other analysis, you cannot separate them. Um, there's a paper by, by Thomas and Shalizi about this. So, so one of them is that you could really have social influence, right? Maybe, maybe people really are changing their behavior in response to what their friends on the network are doing, spread of obesity, spread of smoking, spread of whatever. Um, there's something similar called social learning because there's a difference between adopting a behavior that I already know and learning about a behavior for the first time. Um, Okay, for the obesity example, those two will sort of collapse onto the same thing, but both of these are network mechanisms, even though sociologically they're not quite the same, or they're not the same. Um, another thing that can occur is homophily, and I'm using this word in a very general sense here. The way I'm using the word here is to mean common internal similarities, so, um, which, which is not the most specific meaning um, that a sociologist might use sometimes. And the idea is that these agents, these people are doing the same thing, you know, they're, they're, they're becoming obese, but they happen to be becoming obese at different times, but it's because of an intrinsic similarity. So one that might actually be a sort of homophily would be because perhaps they like fast food. Another might be that they have a genetic predisposition to it. The genetic predisposition is not a social type of homophily, but the, you know, the, the point is they could be inherently similar in some way, but they could be showing the behavior at different times. And that can ex give you the same time series that number one can give you. Um, the third possibility is an environment. So if more McDonald's opened up nearby, more people will eat at it and maybe that will influence people becoming more obese. So it's a common external situation. Or in the case of like, like the London riots, maybe people are angry for the same reason, right? It's not necessarily influence, so it's so something that's the same. And so some common external influence, but they happen to be showing behavior at different times. So again, you could get the same time series. Okay, so if I were gonna try to control one of these things, saying, okay, I don't want people to become obese, or I don't want people in London to riot, or any of those things, how I try to stop this occurring will depend on whether it's one, two, three, or a combination of them. Okay, you expect it to be a combination, but maybe it's 50% one, or maybe it's 100% one, who knows. Okay, so, you know, if people are all angry for the same reason and are rioting, stopping the communication channels is not stopping the mechanism, right? Because the anger is coming separate from the communication channels. Okay, 
So anyway, so that's the sort of generic problem. And, and, and the way that I'm going to, to take a look at this is vastly simplified. I'm a mathematician. I will vastly simplify it. And I'm going to look at some simple forward models. And the nice thing about doing that, besides analytical tractability, is that I can just say, here are the mechanisms that are present in this model. I am going to impose those mechanisms. And I can just say, what can I observe if I know, that, so I know, I know what the mechanism is in my case, I can just, just say, here are the observations that I have based on those mechanisms. So what's the simplest type of model that can lead to certain types of outcomes? And ultimately what you want to do is combine it with parameters estimated from real data, which is something that people are starting to do, um, but it needs to go further. Okay, so efforts to do these simple models um, date back 40 years, so there's a set of models by De Groot, set of models by Noah Friedkin. Um, the, the, the type of models I'll show you, which are called threshold models, actually originated with, with Mark Granovetter. Um, and for those of you who know some of Mark Granovetter's work, it's a paper other than his Strength of Weak Ties paper. It's a different one of his. Everyone likes to cite the other one. Okay, um, The Onion has, I don't know if you've heard of The Onion, but the onion, the onion has a theory about the obesity epidemic where they traced it to one very large person on the Mayflower. I'm not sure how you would go and validate this, but, um, Anyway, this, 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 this article came out like the day before I gave one of these talks um, six months ago, and I'm like, okay, I'm using this slide in this talk forever. Um, okay, so, so, so how can we gain insights? All right, so the most common thing that people do, so the social scientists and the statisticians, and I think there's quite a few computer scientists involved in this as well, do well-controlled experiments and careful data analysis and statistics, right? So if, you know, people who are doing data analysis on Twitter data are usually taking this, this first type of approach. And then the type of approach that, that I want to advocate as, as a complement, it's certainly not a replacement, but I think it's a very good complement, is, is to look at some simple models that are, that are mathematically tractable and so that I can try to understand very deeply what's going on in those particular models. Um, and then, in, again, in general, what you want to do is that you want to have some of this to estimate, some of the first one, I think I'm losing the pointer here, some of the first one to um, estimate parameters like what you would do with a basic reproductive number in, in, in disease models, and then take those parameters, put, in, hopefully there won't be a large number of them, and I'll give, you an, I'll give you an example in, I think, one slide of what those parameters might be. Um, so try to estimate them, and, and then have the simple models but with the parameters from, from real data, and then see how well you can do even with the simplistic model. And, and so, so ultimately, ultimately that's the type of thing that, that I think is a very good way of doing it, and then you can always decide, all right, are there any situations in which these ultra simple models are ever good, or do you fundamentally have to make certain generalizations and so on? Okay, so here is one example of a simple model. Um, it's, it's called the Watts Threshold Model. Um, so it was published in PNAS uh, 12 years ago. It is a modification of, of a model that, that Granovetter did but without network structure in 1978. So I've got a some social network. It's a static network in the, in the original, whoops, it's a static network in the original model. Each node has some threshold, R sub J, so no, the J indexes the nodes, drawn from some distribution. So the mo two most common that are studied are uniform or Gaussian. So when I was talking about parameters being estimated from real data, I'm thinking about these guys. Okay, Th those are the types of things that I would want to estimate from some observations, if possible. And, and so in this case, drawn from some distribution can be one of two states, zero or one. So zero means has not adopted, or is healthy, or is uninfected, or whatnot. One means has adopted, so it's, zero can also mean passive. So one is active, or infected, or adopted, or, 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 or whatever, what have you. I choose some fraction of nodes. So maybe uniformly at random, or maybe I only choose one node, and I say that those nodes are active. Those nodes are early adopters, they have one. Um, and then ultimately that's different in different realizations, so you, you would average over different realizations of doing that. So maybe node number one is active in the first one you try, or node number two is active in the second, and I'll show a plot to illustrate that um, a little bit. Um, now, on the technical side, which I don't focus on in the, in the talk, but I, I want to bring this up because if you, if you actually simulate this, you need to think about it. You can essentially think about either continuous or discrete dynamics. In discrete dynamics, you update everybody at the same time, so it's called synchronous updating. And so I have some update rule that I have not yet explained, and I consider in every discrete time step every node, and I update it according to whatever rule that is. There's also asynchronous updating, um, which amounts to an attempt at continuous time, but with an in with an infinitesimal time step. The idea is that I, so this would be used, um, a mathematician would call it a Gillespie algorithm, a physicist would call it a kinetic Monte Carlo algorithm. You pick some node by some random process, and, and this, in this infinitesimal time step, I will consider the update 
only of that node. So as t goes to infinity, for many models, these will give you the same thing, but the amount of time it will take is different, and the finite time dynamics can be different. So, so sometimes you really do have to care about which of those. Okay, so what's the update rule in this particular case? And there's other models that differ just by having different update rules. I look at my, my threshold, so I'm node j, I look at my threshold, I look at how many of my neighbors are infected. So m is the number of my neighbors who are in this state one who've bought an iPad or whatever. I divide it by my degree. Okay, so I don't have to do it that way, so I'm thinking of what fraction of my neighbors have bought an iPad, and then if this fraction is at least as large as my threshold, which is some sort of resistance for having do, doing it, um, then <coughs> I will deterministically buy an iPad. All right, so you immediately see I've made huge numbers of simplifications from reality. For one thing, I only have two states. For another, if I go from state zero to state one, in this model, I can never go back. So you should imagine that I, if I have any experiment in which people eventually change back, that that is beyond the time scale that I'm exploring, right? So if people change their, their Facebook profile, um, maybe I'm looking at the first change, but if they change back, that's just, that's after what I view as t goes to infinity in this kind of model. Um, and then, yeah, okay. So this thing right here, this m over kj, um, the reason I have that there is that I'm trying to not give extra credit to, to nodes which have high degree. But there are some models in which you might, in which maybe a node with a high degree is more likely to adopt. So if I'm thinking about a Facebook feed, maybe I'm thinking about the number of times it shows up on my feed, and so then it would be the number of neighbors, not the fraction. So it's a modeling choice to take m over kj versus to take um, just m, and it, again, it depends on what you're studying, and you can obviously make this much more complicated if you want. There's going to be a general, um, a general formula for, for a wide class of update rules where things will work, and, and so, so there, is, there is room there for growth even within the confines of, of, of the mathematics. Um, so an important assumption that I make, um, because and so it's unrealistic, but it actually specifically helps certain mathematical approximations, is this monotonicity. If I am, if I go from zero to one, I, in this mechanism, have no way to go back. And that does allow certain types of, of mathematical, um, mathematical analyses, in particular branching processes, um, to work. But it's, it's, you know, this, this is made for simplicity and for mathematics, and so the types of generalizations to think about to make things more realistic is also to relax that. There are some models that relax it. Okay, this is a rewriting of the same mechanism as before in other language. So I'm stealing a slide from my former postdoc, Sergey Melnik. His slides tend to have um, less fancy fonts and fewer colors than mine. Um, but he was the first author on the multi-stage complex contagion behaviors, paper, paper multi-stage complex contagion paper. So, so a bunch of the slides come from him. Okay, so you can write things in the form of a response function. So this is this F. And this response function is exactly encapsulating the update rule that I gave you in mostly words on the last slide. I'm also gonna label a couple sets because it will be convenient for later. I'm gonna label inactive neighbors, in, inactive people as in a set S naught. These are people who do not influence their neighbors. And I'm going to label um, active people uh, in the set S1, and these are people who do influence their neighbors. And, and the reason that I'm introducing these terms is that the multi-stage complex contagion generalization is because I will have an S2. Okay, so that's, that's why it became useful to have those. And, and so the, the, this particular response function, so that I can write things in the form of, of a probability, um, or really a response, is, is the same as before. So, so I'm either exceeding the threshold, which is defined in that way, or I'm not. And so that will end up being part of a calculation within, the, within um, figuring out the probabilities in a branching process calculation. Okay, so I, one thing I mentioned earlier had to do with different initial conditions. When I do a simulation, I am going to need to average over different realizations. My, in this case, my update rule is deterministic, right? So for certain things like the biological epidemics, you have probabilistic update rules, so you would have to average over different realizations of those. In my case, if I fix the graph and I fix the initial conditions, then after that, everything will be deterministic for this particular model. So when I, when I talk about ensembles and averaging, if I, have a, if I have a random graph model, I will need to average over both the graph and the initial conditions. If I have a static graph, I will need to average over the initial conditions. And then that is something that will be compared um, to, to the analytical calculation. Okay, so different initial conditions give different results. So I have a very simple graph here, and I'm going to look at the time goes to infinity um, adoption of, of certain uh, of this. So, so how many nodes have the state one 
in the limit as, as time goes to infinity. So if I start this center node as active and I have a threshold of 0 0.3 um, for each node so that at least if 30% of its neighbors are active, it becomes active. Okay, so what will happen is that I have this node here and then the next step, the ones next to it will become active and so on. And as t goes to infinity, eventually all of them become active. However, if I start over here, I'm never able to activate that node. And once I know the first time that I cannot activate that node, I know that I'm never able to do it. Um, in this particular case, because no, because no reds come from anywhere else, and so I'm stuck with only getting five um, nodes that are activated, five out of the 16. And then over here, I only get two of the nodes activated. So when I'm comparing the fraction of active neighbors, what I would do is average over an ensemble with the different people who started this rumor or who, who started the, who adopted the iPad um, to compare to a to branching process. Okay. So just to remind you, this is a schematic now of, of a certain of the model, and it's showing again the same models before. I have I'm, I can either be below threshold in the set S naught, I can be above the threshold in the set S one. S naught and S one are disjoint, but if I'm barely above the threshold versus strongly above the threshold, I'm exerting the same amount of influence on my neighbors. Okay. So the next slide is what's going to have the generalization for that. What we want are are three stages. So in this case, if I am very strongly above the threshold, in particular, we're going to establish a second threshold. So if I'm above the second threshold, I, have, I exert some amount of influence on my neighbors. So think of these as the leaders of some movement. But if I'm only above the first threshold, I exert less influence on my neighbors. Think of these as the followers of the movement. So S0 and S1 are disjoint. S2 is a subset of S1 the way we have formulated this. Okay, and you don't have to formulate it that way, but we found it convenient. So this is the model with the update rules that I'll show you that was in um, this paper that, that came out last year and that I'll, that I'll spend some time going through, through some parts of. Okay, and just to make sure you remember this generalization, I'm going to show you some, some famous movie characters, movie and TV characters. Um, so the passive nodes are like the dude who ironically are not exerting any influence. The active nodes who are in state S1 are like Jean-Luc Picard, who are exerting influence. And, and yes, we do use this word in the paper, the hyperactive nodes, S2, are, are, are like Dark Helmet. We called it hyperactive so I could make space balls jokes and talks, um, are exerting even more influence on their neighbors. Okay, and remember, S2 is a subset of S1, but S1 is disjoint from S0. All right. So we think of this as a peer pressure. How much, how much is some node experiencing from its neighbors? But it experiences larger peer pressure from, from, from these hyperactive um, neighbors. So I have M1, which is the number of neighbors who are in the set S1, the number of active neighbors, plus some bonus beta times M2, who are the number of, of <coughs> excuse me, the number of neighbors that are in S2. So if a neighbor is an S2, that means that the influence exerted is M1 plus beta M2, and then divided by K, I'm dividing by the number of neighbors I have. Um, but the, but the S2 being a subset of S1 is why this is written as M1 plus beta M2. So it was convenient for, for, for writing down the update rule as far as formulating it that way. So betas are bonus influence. If it's zero, you reduce to the previous model, and the higher it is, the more, the more extra peer pressure is exerted by the hyperactive neighbors. And then the update rule works just as before. So instead of having the fraction, I just have in general this peer pressure. So if you wanted to generalize this further, you would just have a different function here. Um, and if there's two thresholds, there's a lower threshold and a higher threshold. So I want the second threshold to be at least as large as the first for this to make sense. And if I'm at least as large as a certain threshold, I will go into that state. Okay. Um, well, beta is just a parameter we invented. So the lowest part is zero or else the whole formulation doesn't make sense. Um, the examples that we considered tended to have more beta less than one. But, but the way I wrote this doesn't actually have that assumption. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's, this is written in this, writing it as a linear combination is exactly because we formulated the sets that way. But that was, a, that was a choice that we made for our own convenience and is not a choice that you would have to make. Um, okay, so in particular, because we formulated it this way, the model does allow a node to go directly from S0 to S2. Okay, so that can occur. In practice, we have not observed that very often in simulations, but there's nothing that prevents it. 
and then you can write down the response function and so on. Okay. So I want to now show you what this model can do in comparison to the other. So there's a series of numerical experiments that are in the paper, and then there's some analytics. So I'll go over, go over some of these. Um, and then eventually I'll start going a little bit faster just to show you some hints of some more recent things. Um, the network in question that we use, I have some old Facebook data from 2005. This is the pre-Cambrian era from Facebook in contrast to the Cambrian era of 2007. And I have 100 different universities, and so you can imagine this as the type of network on which some influence really would spread. So for example, I have one from the University of Oklahoma, which has 18,000 nodes. It's a very highly clustered network because social networks tend to be that way. And so if we, put, if we insert these thresholds and we put, say, 2% of the nodes initially active, which is a decently large amount, actually, then you get the following. So the, the horizontal axis is time. The vertical axis is the fraction of people in state 1 in the node, in, in the network. And we're here, we're keeping track of what state people are in. Remember, this purple is strongly above threshold. It's just we're pretending they're strongly above thresholds in this case would mean larger than 0.3, but in the, in, the, in, the, in the left, we're not giving them bonus influence, and in the right, we are. And so what happens in the left is that you don't get a cascade. You don't get very many people adopting, and in the right, you are. Okay, so this model that we have was constructed to do this, right? So this, this, is, not, this is just illustrating something that we built the model to do. And, you know, okay, so we, we, had, we had to add a decent number of, of influence to do this. Okay, somewhat less obvious, but it makes sense after you think about it. I, but in this case, we did not actually build the model to, to be able to do it, is an S1 cascade can facilitate an S2 cascade. So by having more sheep, it is possible, in this model at least, to get a cascade of leaders. Um, I cannot come up with something from, I don't have an example from like real life where people have illustrated this as the mechanism that has occurred. So, so maybe eventually I'll be able to Someone, from his, someone who knows something from history to give me an example. But the point is, um, I can get more cascades by adding sheep. And the way this works is that imagine I take my first threshold. If they're both the same, um, I only have you know, two states in total rather than three by definition. I lower the first threshold so I make it easier to become a sheep. And therefore, I can get a cascade that way. So I'm, I'm purposely saying facilitates, not causes, be because this is not actually giving a causal relation. It's just saying by having a lower threshold, I can get I can get a cascade, which makes sense after you think about it, but was not something that we constructed the model in advance to do, like like the previous example. Okay, so we have some things that can occur, and now so now it's going to get a bit more abstract. Um, we 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 use a certain random graph model, and I'll, I'll define it for you. Um, that, that allows us to have, to, have, to have a lot of control over when certain nodes change their, their state. And, and so these graph models are not realistic social networks, but they were very convenient to, to develop a more precise understanding. Okay, so we call these Z1, Z2 regular random graphs. Um, it's a generalization of Z regular random graphs, which says that every node has the same degree, and otherwise I connect them up um, uniformly at random. I take, I consider um, one edge of a node, and I randomly connect to another edge of a node, and I repeat until everything is um, completely connected. Okay. Um, in this case, I have two types of pieces. I have pieces with degree Z1 and pieces with degree Z2. And then sometimes, or, or I will specify also the relative fraction of each, so I might specify that there's one-third Z1 and two-thirds Z2, or in this case, half Z1 and half Z2. And in some models, I will specify how often they're connected to each other in a joint distribution. In some models, I will not. So if I fix the degree distribution and just say I have this, so fixing the degree distribution will amount to fixing the fraction of nodes of each type, or of, of yeah, of nodes of each type, um, but not fixing how often they're connected to nodes of their own type or nodes of other types. If I fix a joint distribution, I'm also going to say, okay, um, for example, maybe all, in this case, I have nodes of degree four. On average, three of them are, uh, three of the edges connect to nodes of degree four, and one of them connects to nodes of degree 24. And in the case of the degree 24, on average, 23 of those connect to nodes of degree 24, and one of those connects to nodes of degree four. Right? So if I only take P of K, I get a special case of what's called the configuration model. And if I take this other one, I get a special case of a generalization of the configuration model. 
Okay, so, so let's take this 4 and 24 example. And, and the reason I'm doing this is that, is that if I do, if I take this 4 and I, this 24, and with these specific thresholds, I know exactly how many neighbors, um, how many active neighbors uh, and, and, and hyperactive neighbors a degree 4 node needs in order to advance. And I know exactly how many of those neighbors a degree 24 node needs in order to, to advance. So, so this random graph makes it much easier to get a handle on things because I know in advance the conditions that allow a node to advance because I've controlled them. Okay. So, so what do you get in a certain example? So again, it's going to be these are these are the same sets of simulations, but in one case I have beta equals zero, and in the other case I have beta equals 0.45. So I'm averaging over the same hundred realizations of the random graph, and the same hundred uh, um, initial conditions, but but one case I have no bonus, and one case I do. Uh, this is the fraction of nodes which are in state one, um, and and well in state one and in state two. Um, on the vertical axis, although state two does not exist on the top, and it's time on the horizontal axis. So if I only just look at the network as a whole, I get, okay, half of the nodes, you know, eventually become active. But then because I know exactly what types of nodes they are, what you end up actually finding is that all of the degree four nodes become active and none of the degree 24 nodes become active, okay? So you can separate what different types of nodes are doing in this simplified case. Um, and then on the bottom, I give this bonus influence. I mean, the 0.45 was just chosen so we can illustrate these dynamics, not because it has any special meaning. And what happens is at first, the degree four nodes go into state one. Then enough of those go into state one that eventually some start going into state two. And so a bunch of those go into state two. So at that point, you're over here right, with your overall S1, and then what will happen is that because this is chosen randomly, there'll be some degree 24 nodes that even though on average they only have one degree 4 neighbor, some of them will say have a couple of degree 4 neighbors, and so those will start to change. And once those change, the whole dominoes fall. Okay, right, so, so the idea is that because we chose this random graph model, basically we know exactly what happens. Okay, that was numerics. You can actually get those curves like that analytically, and they do, for that kind of model, they'll do very well. Um, we're going to consider the case where we fix P of K, so we know the relative fraction of degree four and tw 24 neighbors, but we don't know who they're connected to other than uniformly at random, and you can get analytical expressions for the time um, dependence of how many states, how many nodes there are in state S1 and how many there are in state S2, right? So, so, not e so it's a time dependent, um, calculation. It uses some assumptions. Um, so mean field theory is a type of theory that gets used when you write down an ODE model, but in this case you're we're actually deriving a mean field theory, saying there's enough connectivity that, you, that the average connectivity will be useful, will be enough in some cases, rather than keeping track of, of the changes of every single node. Um, locally tree-like, so these are papers that go into the more, more technical things of what those assumptions mean. Um, locally tree-like means I have a sequence of graphs, so I get the number of nodes going, going to infinity, and as I take that sequence of graphs um, with those nodes going to infinity, all the, the, the measure of loops will go to zero in that limit, but of all loops, so of triangles and squares and so on. So for a real network, I won't ever really be able to check that condition, but you can calculate quantities like clustering coefficients that measure how many fractions of triangles are closed. And so if you have a real network with a small fraction, of, with a small clustering coefficient, then the hope is that this should, that should be close enough to what the actual hypotheses are that this kind of calculation should work. At least that's the hope. Um, it's much more subtle than that. It's much more subtle than that both on when it works and when it does not work. Okay, so what does the basic analytical approach do? And I'll, I'll show you some of the equations. I'm not gonna go in too much detail because this is the type of thing that you should really you know, go home and think about it if you want to really learn that. Um, it's, a gen so I'm gonna, it's a generalization of this of these single stage, so the Watts type model um, to two stages. So, so my colleague James Gleason has uh, some, several good papers that are present, have nice presentations of it, like this one from 2008. So some advantages, one is that it's intuitive. Two is that you can generalize it to several other processes. I wrote down response function, a response function f, and so basically if you take a response function f that satisfies certain conditions, any function that does that, and there's a decent number, a lot of percolation problems that people study will satisfy it. Some of the simple biological epidemic problems people study will satisfy it. And the actual analytical formula just has the generic function in there, and so you can, you can plug that in to use it for many processes beyond what we do. Um, Okay, so what are the limitations? So, so one is that th this version of it, as I said, there's some generalizations, works for monotonic dynamics only, 
which is a very severe, severe limitation when it comes to real, real social influence. Um, the other is that it's only giving an expected active fraction rather than the whole distribution. So I take my numerical simulations, I average over the ensemble, and I compare that average to what the theory is giving me, right? So I'm not getting the distribution of what might happen. And, and, and for some things, right, in real, in real life, when you have, you don't really have those averages in most situations. You know, something went viral or it didn't, you have an instance. So, so that's also a limitation. Okay, and then I'm going to explain this using the single stage one as an example, and I'll show you the spot in the process where this locally tree-like type of, of, of assumption gets used. Okay, so the idea is the following. I have some focal node. Um, say it's this one. Um, the node either started as active or it had a chance of becoming active. If it became active, it had to get influenced by its children. The locally tree-like assumption is that I'm not allowing it to get influenced by its parent. So if there's too many cycles and there's too many parents that come and influence it, I'm going to get a, a bad approximation. Okay? So it's the fact that I can do this by levels, which is, why, which is why you make that assumption. So you either start active or you did not start active, and you have, just a, com you have a combinatorial calculation of the ways in which you could have become active based on how likely you are to become active for a given number of neighbors active, summing over... Those neighbor, which number of neighbors that is, and the probability of those occurring, right? So this is, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm arbitrarily calling this one children. I mean, that's. I'm pick, I'm I'm picking a direction because it doesn't. Uh, you normally call it children in branching processes because of, because of how they were invented, um, because you're thinking of genealogical um, descendants. But that's completely arbitrary. But the the idea though is that when I update this, I can only go below me, and I'm not allowing myself to go above me. So if, so if there's too many loops that go up here, that's a way to cause it to go wrong. I could have if I wanted to, but this is following just the usual convention. Um, okay, so you can go through and you can turn the crank, and what happens is you get an algebraic equation, and the analytical curves that, that, I'll, that I'll show you on a couple plots are numerical solutions of algebraic equations as compared to averages over, over stochastic processes. I will skip the interlude, which goes through a little bit more some of those subtleties on, on, on those fields, on, on, the, on, those, on those approximations. So the difference between doing the multi-stage model, I now have to do um, this formula, I have to have it both for an S1 and S2. So it's very much like the ones in the single stage case, except the combinatorics is a more intricate calculation, right? So you have to just go and work a little bit harder to work through what the formulas are. Um, this diagram actually, well, you probably want to stare at it for a little while, then longer than I'm going to let you stare at it um, to, get, to get that to work. But conceptually, I, I hope, hopefully I've conveyed what this type of approximation does and what assumptions it needs. And then if you are interested in actually working out the specifics, th this is the type of reason that I put these slides on SlideShare, right? So you can, you can see it and go through it. Okay, so let's, let's show some comparisons of, of the numerics and, and, and the theory, and then I also want to talk about a couple of these, these other projects that I, that I hinted at, they'll only do those quickly. So over here I have the amount of extra influence, and here I have the equilibrium um, fraction of adopted neighbors, and the cool thing here, and so this is also one of these um, Z1, Z2 regular random graphs, the cool thing here is that the bifurcation diagrams that tell you when the dynamics change, you can actually get analytically, not just numerically. And so at least for some examples, right, it's not going to work perfectly for all examples, um, it balances very nicely. You can also get the time evolution um, for each of these states. And so beta, so this is now from in this regime over here with this particular amount of, uh, of, of bonus. And it's in this regime because the pieces I have allow me to know exactly when each type of node advances. Okay, so then you get this in the S1 case, and in the S2 case, you get this. It works pretty nicely. You'll notice that it, there's, there's a little bit off, and it turns out there's systematic reasons that it's a little bit off. So it works well, but not perfectly. And then, of course, if you use more complicated networks that don't satisfy certain assumptions, it will work less well. Um, you, can, you can do some more complicated networks, though. You can do what's called an Erdős-Rényi graph. So um, this particular one, 
should be, um, well, so in this case, it's, it's GNP. That means that I have an independent probability P for each pair of nodes to determine whether it's connected. And, and we determine the probability P, and I don't remember what it was, so that the mean number of neighbors is, is five in this case. And so you get more um, plateaus, but again, the theory and the, um, and the numerics agree very nicely. Okay, you can also use non-uniform thresholds, which are a bit more realistic. And so then instead of getting plateaus, you get um, smooth out steps. There's, if you look carefully, you'll notice that there's a little bit more disagreement that occurred as a result of this, but you have to look at this particular plot carefully to see it. Um, and then I want to tell you about um, a couple of the things that our theory specifically does not get. Um, I believe I know how to generalize it to get these things, but it was more interesting for us to move on to other things. So this is, this is more the type of, type of exercise that I would give to a graduate student so to help them learn these types of methods in the first place. Um, because it's, it's sort of at the level of a technical exercise relative to what we've done. The cool thing is it, it, there is some systematic stuff involved. So, so one of them is a, a toy version of what's sometimes called the June bug effect. Um, so this, this is a famous incident that occurred in June. Um, of, I don't know, the 40s or 30s. There's an entire book called The June Bug. And it was some factory in a northeastern state, maybe in New Jersey, and there's this guy who in June was complaining about being sick. And pretty soon, his friends started complaining about being sick because they thought they were sick. And then eventually, he believed his own rumor and really thought he was sick instead of just pretending. So, okay, so the precise thing in the context of the model is the following. It's, so it is, believing one's own gossip is a bit of a more precise way of what's going on in the model than, than saying June bug, but it's, it's a toy version of this. So we have an S1 active node J. It influences its neighboring nodes at S0 to become S1 active. So, you, so, so, so for those of you who follow baseball, you should think of, you know, Tommy Lasorda building himself up into, a fur, in, into fury. Um, so, you know, it influences the neighbors to become S1 active. And so those guys are S1 active, which influences the first person to become S2 active, believing his own rumor by going from S1 to S2 as a result of, of the neighbors. Okay, this is what's an example of what's called a dynamical correlation. I actually skipped that part of the talk. Um, there's two types of correlations. There's structural and dynamical. A structural correlation would be along the lines of how often are degree five nodes connected to degree four nodes? If I specify the joint probability, that's an example of a structural correlation. A dynamical correlation says when I update nodes, I cannot just consider them one at a time, but I might have to consider the neighbor of my node when I choose whether I'm going to be updated. So that's an example of a dynamical correlation. So what ends up happening is if I go to t goes to infinity, I get the exact, cor exactly correct final fraction of S2 nodes, but the theory will, underest will underestimate them in the temporal dynamics because of essentially exactly this. Okay, there's another one, which in the paper we called se state segregation before we came up with a better name. So you hang up first, no, you hang up first. So you should think of Anakin and Padme in, 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 in Star Wars, I think two, um, you know, not being able to go apart or something like that. Um, so you adopt first, no, you adopt first. So a node J has a sufficiently high threshold um, such that to become S2 active, it needs all its neighbors, for example, to be S1 active. However, one of those neighbors needs this node J to become S2 active for it itself to advance. So the two are sort of stuck to each other, waiting to see which domino will fall first. But as soon as one domino falls, the other one will also fall. That's why it's a you hang up first, no you hang up first. And so this ends up um, um, over, overstating, overestimating the observed fraction, although again, it gets the t goes to infinity right. So basically what happens is that the cascade goes around the rest of the network, goes around a much longer loop. And so eventually one of those two adopts and then the other adopts. Right, so, so these are the, sort of the two of the systematic reasons why you observe some of the um, inaccuracies in some of the plots I showed and that you would observe larger inaccuracies in, in situations where you have more clustering or other things where the, where the hypotheses are not satisfied. Okay, I'm going to switch gears a bit and just give you a couple hints and then I know we started a little bit late so I hope to, I'll go a few more minutes, but I won't go too much longer. Um, so I'll give you a couple hints. So one thing is that I've been, I've been talking to these people who do persistence homology. So we've got a paper currently under review. Uh, I don't have our referee reports yet, so we don't know, we don't know the damage yet, but it's, it's being reviewed by a fancy journal. And we're using some ideas from computational topology. And those, those things have a couple of very cool things 
that are there. And this is my excuse to learn some, of the, some more of those topics. One cool thing that, that these methods are good for is, is that they go beyond pairwise relations. Most of the studies of networks, because of um, the types of, of tools that are available, tend to focus on pairwise relations, right? An edge is a pairwise relation between, um, between a pair of nodes. But some of the things that I already talked about that I hinted at earlier needed higher order relations, maybe three cycles or four cycles. Um, but you can only, you, you know, in, in standard network science, you only do those in, in, as sequences of pairs. Um, topological methods allow you to consider more than two nodes at once. They're very natural for that. So that's, that's one, of the one of the cool reasons of doing it. And in particular, um, homology, which is the study of holes, has discrete analogs and can be made you know, very powerful computationally, not just theoretically, and so that that becomes a convenient tool to do it. You know, when do one cycles get born? When do when or when when do other type more complicated types of cycles get born? Um, one of the hypotheses that is needed for those types of things is, is constructing something that's called a filtration, is monotonic dynamics. So we already have one of the hypotheses, the main one that we would need to use that technology. So you can use that technology, you can filter according to the dynamics, which is a very unusual way of filtering from the perspective of the computational topologist. I think I'll, that, that's something I can bring up again at the end if anyone wants to know more about that. But it's an unusual way of filtering. Um, and what you can do is that you can take different trajectories. You map them into what's called a barcode space. You have a proper distance in barcode space. So you can now map back and talk about distances between different trajectories. Um, I come from dynamical systems, and dynamical systems is built for t goes to infinity calculations. So this gives at least some hope of getting how different trajectories, are, you know, how different some trajectories are without going all the way to t goes to infinity. Okay, so I've told you all this good stuff. Why, why do I not just, you know, solve everything now? Uh, the computational scaling is horrible. Like, imagine how horrible the worst one you know is and make it worse. Computational scaling is horrible, so you have to make all sorts of approximations or use small networks, and you don't want to have finite size effects, and you don't want to make approximations that end up giving you results that are artifacts of algorithms. So, so, so computationally, there's a lot of work to do, and we ended up designing a project that we could do a couple specific things. And the specific thing that we did is that I'm going to go back to the, um, to the Black Plague. And if you have, when you have diseases, a bunch of diseases will actually skip some countries, right? Why do they skip some countries? Even the countries that are maybe more nearby, right? They will skip some countries. So there's actually a couple different things that can occur. You can either have, via a social network, the appearance of a, of a new cluster of contagions, or if you have some underlying backbone, you can have a wavefront along that. And so you actually have a, a mixture. And so the thing that we studied with this was when do you have um, some sort of contagion, in this case a social contagion, going along a backbone, which we, which we put in an underlying geometry in the network. Think of a road network like, like in the city of London. And when do you have new clusters occurring? Think of shortcuts that would come from metro stations, right? So, so both of these things occur. And it's not just that you never have wavefront propagation before, but now we're saying, when do you have really a diffusion process along some underlying space, and when do you have jumps, right? So it's going back a little bit to the original. You really have mixtures of both. When new freshmen come to Oxford in, in October, you know, they go and they sit in the dining hall, and the dining hall sits 200 people, people very close to each other. The disease is diffusing when you're in the dining hall because you really do have all-to-all -all connectivity, right? But you have other times when it's not. Okay. So... I hope I've tantalized you enough that you'll look at that paper, but you can look at things with, ge with geometry and topology and dimensionality. You end up, by accident, getting a, um, a, a different form of nonlinear re dimension reduction than what people had been doing. Um, so lots of cool things. Uh, so so uh, we have a, it's like a six or seven page paper with a 50 page supplement, but maybe you'll be interested to look at least at the six or seven page paper. The other one that I want to bring up, again, I'll go kind of quickly, just because we're towards the end, is popularity cascades on Facebook. And this was actually why I brought up that particular ex example, because we used their data. We worked with, with those two authors um, to do this. Uh, one is at Oxford, one used to be at Oxford. And this, this particular study does not actually have network structure. The type of information we have, it's over two months, and it's once an hour, and every hour we have the rank order, but also the number of, of, of applications. You know, how many people have pirates and ninjas in total? How many people have, um, um, uh, what's it called? Um, one of the whole, Texas Hold'em poker in total. All these very highbrow applications that used to dominate Facebook. Um, and so what we do is we have a generative model, and the generative model says there's two mechanisms, so we're not promising that other mechanisms can't occur. 
you either look at the list of top applications and you have some chance of adopting an application from this list, or you look at your feed and you adopt something from one of your friends, and within looking at your feed, you also have a parameter that says, how far back do you go? Do I look back one hour? Do I look back two hours? And so on. So if you do this, and you, if you take these mechanisms, so you have a couple parameters. If you look at the long time behavior, and you compare the qualitative dynamics with any choice of these parameters, um, I guess I don't have that, that plot, or I have a couple examples. I have a couple examples of that plot of two, two versions of it, two choices of parameters. If you compare the long time behavior, you get the same qualitative results for all of these. It's not quite the same quantitatively, but the same qualitative results, right? This, this, blue, this blue and this, this purple have completely different values of the parameters, but if I take long time, I get the same thing. If, however, I incorporate, you know, I do, we, do, we do training on the data for the first couple of days, so we're only predicting after the first couple of days. Um, so basically when there's a bit of a steady-ish state, there's a, there's, a, there's a transient when applications are first introduced that we're, that we're not modeling but we're incorporating, um, you get completely different behavior in the time dependence but the same behavior in the long time. This part is a cartoon of the mechanism. Um, okay, so, so why is that important? I mean, so this is, this is an example of actually using some data, it's a small data project, using some data in a simple model, but using it in a way to really make the model go farther. Um, a lot of people, I mean, some of you have heard me name their names before, I will, I will not name their names um, while we're recording, um, but um, a lot of people will, 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 will study various models and they'll say, okay, I'm gonna look at this as T-Ghost Infinity and I find a power law and this mechanism gave me a power law or gave me something else and therefore I'm gonna now somehow say that this mechanism is what's going on. Except for the fact that long time, two completely different mechanisms give you the same thing, right? So all you can do if you do that kind of study is that you can rule out mechanisms. But I cannot promise that some other mechanism cannot give the same thing, and in particular, considering temporal dynamics and not just going to a long time equilibrium is really important. So in particular, something here that I cannot rule out, I only considered a couple mechanisms. Well, in the, in the supplementary information, we consider a few more. But maybe there's a mechanism that I did not consider that could also produce this, right? So I cannot promise that. I can only promise within the confines of the mechanisms I considered. But, you know, equilibrium behavior, long time behavior is not enough because different, very different things, very different mechanisms could give you the same results if you're only looking at long time. So that's what that paper with this one specific example is trying to illustrate. You know, Facebook data from 2007 by itself is probably not the most important thing in the world, but, but the message about how you should model complex systems is very important. All right, so I'm gonna now go to the conclusion slide and um, I will stop there.